Hi, my name is Bruce Potenza, and I'm the uh, director of the uh, Regional Burn Center here at uh, UC uh, San Diego, the University of California, San Diego. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the initial assessment of burn injury. This is part of our mini-series that is directed to uh, pre-hospital uh, personnel uh, education uh, for our burn uh, victims. Let's talk uh, a little bit today and start the lecture by talking about the etiology uh, and the types of burns with the same uh, characteristics that we talk about mechanism of injury uh, in uh, trauma. And let's review for just a second what actually causes a burn. A burn is caused by some uh, element uh, that is going to carry a heat uh, substance to you. How many BTUs is in there will help determine how hot this is. The length of time that that heat is in contact with your skin will then determine whether or not you sustain a burn. So it's BTUs, uh, times the amount of time that the patient is in contact with that, divided, if you will, by how uh, strong uh, your skin is. So in a person who has normal skin, we will have one set of uh, burns that will occur given a certain set of BTUs in time. If we look at the elderly population whose skin is actually thinning, the dermal layer of the skin thins as we age, it takes either less BTUs or less time in contact with the BTUs to create a deeper uh, burn injury. And if we look here on these different mechanisms, just we have skulls, we have highly flammable materials such as gasoline, other types of fuels, we have electrical injuries, we have smoke induced uh, injury uh, resulting in uh, lung injury. And all of these bring potentially different amount of BTUs uh, to the wounding of the uh, patient. So when I hear from you all in the pre-hospital uh, what the mechanism of injury was, this is a gentleman who was uh, working on an electrical panel. Uh, there were 440 volts uh, uh, in the uh, panel. Uh, the patient was in contact with the panel for three minutes, gives me a good idea of what I might expect to see. So when we think about this, we want to know the circumstances of the bird injury. What type of flame or what type of heat was involved? What was the length of time that the burn the, the was, uh, the, 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 the hot material was in contact with the patient? Did the patient's clothes catch fire in addition to the initial fire that the patient was in? Uh, did the burn occur in a closed space or an open space area? And by that I mean, did it occur here in a room? If it's here in a room where I've got a ceiling and four walls and a floor, then whatever's burning in the room is consuming the oxygen as well as building up toxic byproducts of combustion in the room. So I might have a secondary smoke inhalation injury in addition to my burn injury. So that's why it's important to know is it closed space or open space? And open space just means it's outdoors. And what initial treatment did you give to the patient when they came in. Did you lavage the patient because they were exposed to a chemical injury? Did they have supplemental oxygen for their inhalation injury? Did they get metodose inhalers, etc.? These are all important things for us to know. House fires are the most common types of injuries that we're going to see related to flame here in San Diego County and everywhere in North America. 73% of all burn fatalities occur in a structure fire. Most of them occur at night. That's why it's so important that we get out and really hit the prevention with the smoke detectors and now the carbon monoxide detectors here in, in the state of, uh, of California. If you look at this, 12 patients die a day. 12 people die a day, I'm repeating that, due to a structure fire. And again, most structure fires occur at night. Most of them occur with people sleeping. So you need to have a good warning system to be able to get out. An automobile fire is important to, to think about when you come onto the scene because if there's flame associated with this motor vehicle crash, it's likely that our patient has both traumatic injuries as well as flame and smoke inhalation injuries. For a car to catch fire, for the actual cabin to catch fire, it is an exceedingly hot fire because everything inside that cabin is flame retardant. So it's not going to ignite until the temperatures are much higher. And for a patient to get burned inside their car cabin, they're usually either A, unconscious, or B, they're trapped within that cabin and can't get out. So their exposure time is long, the heat of the fire is, is hot, and the, the toxic byproducts of smoke combustion are, are, are in the air, making for a very, very bad burn and inhalation injury. Just something to think about when you come on scene. This is an important graph here, and I just want to call your attention to the uh, right and left curves here. 
This is a graph that on the vertical axis here, this is the percent survival with 100% survival up at the top, 10% survival at the bottom. Along the x-axis here, we are dealing with the total uh, body percent that is burned. So 5% over here, 75% all the way on the right side of the graph. Now look here on the right side of the graph, columns, uh, lines 2 and 3. These represent people who are ages 3 years of age to 40 years of age. And if we look at this, somebody who is in one of those curves between 3 and 40 years of age, 50% of them will survive with a 65% burn. 65% total body surface area burn carries with it a 50% survivability in today's uh, mo modern era. But if you're 70 years of age or greater, it takes only about a 23% total body surface area burn to result in 50% mortality. Why is that? It's because of the comorbid disease that the patient brings to the table when they have that burn. They get an exacerbation of their unstable angina. They develop a myocardial infarction and die. They develop an exacerbation of their COPD. They get a pneumonia on top of their COPD and they can't tolerate that. They come in with chronic renal insufficiency. They get antibiotics. They get dehydrated perhaps due to the resuscitation and inadequate resuscitation of the, the burn and develop a worsening renal insufficiency and they end up dying uh, a renal death. So all these kind of comorbid disease factors come into play when you're dealing with the elderly. And it's important to remember, it's not a very big burn in which half the patients over 70 years of age will die versus everybody else over here whose burn LD50 is about 65%. Just important things to know about. Let's talk about the burn with respect to burn wound depth first, and then we'll talk about calculation of total body surface area. And in one of the other lectures, we'll talk a little bit about the initial resuscitation and management of these patients. In layman's terms, we have first, second, third degree, and fourth degree burns. But what's important in the second degree burns, which are also called partial thickness burns, we have superficial burns, and we have deep partial thickness burns. Why is that important? This is a little schematic here, just looking at the histopathology uh, of, of, of skin. We have an epidermal layer here, the most superficial layer. That is essentially the plastic sheath that determines the boundary between the outside world and you. It keeps everything in you that needs to be in you and everything out of you that shouldn't be in you. Deep to that though is the dermis, and the dermis is the scaffolding on which the epidermis lies on. In the dermis itself, this is where you have the strength of the skin, the elasticity of the skin. This is where you have your major nerve endings. This is where you have your hair follicles and your sweat glands. And why are those things important? Particularly the hair follicles, at the base of the hair follicles, contain germinal centers. And in those germinal centers, actually new epithelial cells are made and marginate up to your skin. So each one of your hair follicles is a potential new source of epithelium to grow. So if you have a superficial burn, even if it's a very large superficial burn, not only will it try to heal from the outside in, but it tries to heal from all these little islands of your hair follicles that are pushing up epithelial cells. We call them epithelial buds when we see the, the, the little buds growing on the skin. And that helps populate the skin and then it grows in a circumferential manner and gets bigger and spreads until it meets the next budding area from the hair follicle next to it. And this is how we have skin that's able to heal with a superficial partial thickness burn. You go into a deep partial thickness burn and you begin to take out some of those germinal centers in the hair follicles and it behaves a little bit more like a full thickness burn or a third degree burn. Let's look at it on a side cut here. On this side cut here, if we look at the epidermis, which is kind of this purple layer here, this is the first living, real living layer of the skin. It's the outermost layer of the skin. The brown layer on top of that are the keratinocytes. And the keratinocytes are essentially dead epithelial cells that are going to marginate off your skin. So every winter when we take a shower and we wipe ourselves down, and we see this kind of white uh, dandruff, if you will, on our skin, that is the keratinocyte layer that is beginning to slough off. And new keratinocytes are growing up as new epidermis grows up. But here in the epidermis, this is an important layer. This is where first degree burns occur. They are usually a result of a mechanism of uh, ultraviolet light called sunburn. But any other type of light can cause a first degree burn if the exposure time is just very short. Think of it. 
If you're sitting next to your roaring fire in your fireplace, or you have a heater that's going on in your garage in the middle of winter, if you get close enough, you'll get that kind of erythema of your skin, and you'll actually sustain pot potentially a first degree burn. Now, as we get deeper into the dermis, we have our superficial layer of uh, dermis, and this is a partial thickness superficial burn. If it gets deeper in the dermis, this is a deep partial thickness burn. And if it gets into the yellow area here, the fat, the deeper connective tissue, or down into the muscle or bone, these are third and fourth degree burns as we get down into the deep fascia and into the bone. So, First degree involves the dermis, second degree, I'm sorry, involves the epidermis, second degree involves all of the dermis with a superficial second degree burn and a deep second degree burn. Third degree gets epidermis and all of the dermis, and a fourth degree goes down all the way into deep muscle and, and bone. Here's an example of someone who is just out on the beach for too long who has a, what? First degree burn. Just see the erythema here. Topical moisturizers, Tylenol, aspirin, non steroidals, all will make this feel better. It just needs to run its course. If this wound blisters up, it is no longer a first degree burn. Just because it's a sunburn, sun is the mechanism of injury, the exposure there, how long they were out, may be sufficient so that this person comes in and has multiple blisters on. It is now a second degree burn or a partial thickness burn. And it's probably gonna be a superficial partial thickness burn. Here's our, 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 our superficial partial thickness burn here. This is a child, this is a typical pull down scald. Child reaches up, pulls a pot over, uh, pulls some soup over, usually hits the side of the face. Child feels the hot water or hot soup coming down the arm, looks away, so we tend to see the opposite side of the face looking away that has a burn, as well as burn coming down onto the thorax here. And if you look right here in the middle, you can see the light, it's very much shining off this burn. This burn is not dull in appearance. Dull in appearance tells us it's a deeper burn. It's got nice shine to it, and it's got this kind of pink salmon look to it. This is a very superficial partial thickness burn this child has. This is a, a, an in-between now. This is moving from a superficial partial thickness burn to a deeper partial thickness burn. Again, it's a scald me mechanism of injury. This is a different child, and the reason I'm showing you this, this child has not been debrided. The blisters are just like you brought them in off the gurney. You don't see the blisters, they've already broken. You see the blister skin kind of piled up here around the neck, as well as down here towards the patient's uh, lower torso. Now, there are areas, particularly up on the face, where we see some of the blisters that it looks nice and shiny. May not be as deep of a partial thickness burn. But if we look at that chest, now we're beginning to see the chest is a little more white in it. This is a little bit deeper partial thickness burn, almost in an intermediate uh, partial thickness burn. So a little bit deeper here on this uh, child. Same child here. Again, on the left, you see the child has not been debrided. On the right now, this is what the child looks like after we've debrided them. We've sedated the child, we've cleaned off all the dead skin and all the bullet. And now you get a look, and actually a little time has elapsed here. A few hours have gone, gone by. The, the child was admitted at night. We put an initial bandage on this child, and then in the morning we gave the child some anesthesia after they've been MPO. And so this is maybe about six or eight hours after the initial injury. Look here on the right side. This child's anterior torso on the right actually has a little more white in it than what I showed you earlier on. And, and now it's beginning to look a little bit deeper, partial thickness, uh, thickness sperm. And as it turned out, uh, if you look on the right side here, right in the external area and right under the child's chin were the deepest sperms that this child had. He did not require skin grafting for this, but did require some operative procedures to try and get him to uh, heal. <coughs> Excuse me, this is someone now who has uh, put the back of their hand up against a hot object in the kitchen. It happened to be the oven door. When you look at this, you see the big bulla here. So we know we've got a second degree or partial thickness burn. We don't know how deep it is. One easy trick, though, to look at this is when we look at the skin that's over the blister, it still looks like normal skin with just fluid underneath it. Remember that because I'm going to show you the same picture of a child with a Palmer injury uh, on the hand and that look of that blister will be entirely different. Now as we unroof this blister, 
it's still a partial thickness burn, but here it's a deep partial thickness, deeper partial thickness burn, okay? It's a little bit, little bit wider than, than what I've showed you before. You all see this a lot out in uh, the, the pre-hospital area. This is a patient who was uh, working on roof and uh, was working with hot tar. In the top picture, you see the dorsum of the hand where the tar is stuck, and on the bottom picture, you see the palmar surface where the, the, the tar is stuck. What can they do uh, in, in the field uh, to try and help this out? Hopefully this patient either had the presence of mind or his co-workers had the presence of mind to douse this with cool water to try and take the heat out. Because once this tar gets on your hand, you're not going to get it off in the field. This is very hard to get off. It requires numerous scrubbings. We use simple things like mineral oil or we go to Home Depot or Lowe's and we buy a big jar of goop uh, that uh, we keep in, in the uh, clinic and in the hospital to get this off. And it takes us usually a couple of days to get it off. If you happen to come on scene and that's not been done, go ahead and put this into some cool water just to take whatever's left of the heat uh, out of the uh, tar. This is the same person's hands after all that tar has been cleaned off. If you look on the right side here, you see the dorsum of the hand, and you can see that there is some blistering on the dorsum of the hand, but a lot of the hands actually still intact. Versus on the left side, you see the palmar aspect of the hand where we can see the erythema and redness from this burn. And actually, this tar must not have been very hot at all because this is a more superficial partial thickness burn. And we see these a little bit more rarely, and we tend to see much more hotter tar burns resulting in either deep partial thickness burns or full thickness burns for the patients who are involved in the, in the tarring. Now this is an example of, again, second degree burns or partial thickness burns. These are some of the deeper burns. So not only is the epidermis and the superficial layer of the dermis involved, but it's deep into the dermis. And if you look at this arm, it's just a little more pale looking again than what we saw. Remember initially we saw some nice pink, shiny skin after it's all clean. Now we tend to see a more pinky white colored skin and it tends to lose its sheen and it starts to look dull to us. So let's look. This is the child I was telling you about. Remember the blister I showed you on the dorsum of the hand? The skin looked like normal skin. This is a palmer burn and now the skin of the bulli itself of the blister looks this real pale white. And the reason it looks pale white is because what's underneath here. If you look at the way this burn is tattooed onto the fingertips, and onto the palm. This is a typical unintentional injury. Unintentional injury. Child puts their hand up against something. This happened to be a hot iron. Feels and senses the heat on the tips of the fingers and the palm and pulls away. Intentional injuries tend to look like the hand is pressed up against the iron, pressed up against the, the oven door, and the entire hand looks burned like it's been tattooed right onto the surface. Important thing to keep in the back of your mind. Here's that same child with that bull eye removed. This is really, really pale. This range is between a deep partial thickness to now a full thickness burn. The difference here is that our anatomy of our skin is different everywhere. And on the palm of our hands and on the sole of our feet, the plantar aspects of our feet, we have the thickest dermis than anywhere else in our body. So these wounds that look really deep on the palmar surface or the plantar surface, actually a lot of these can, can, can heal. And there's a reason for that thick dermis. These are the hard working areas of your body, the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. You need that toughness to get through life. This is a gentleman and I put this picture on. He's got deep partial thickness burns to his face to give you an idea what that looks like at about 48 hours. This is a gentleman who came in 70% structure fire flame has these burns to his face. Look how his face is going to look different from this picture to the next picture as a result of his uh, burn resuscitation here. And this is why you need to have good airway secured before you get into this situation. You are not going to see this in the pre-hospital area, but you will begin to see edema forming in these patients at six to eight hours. If they happen to be held at another hospital or you're involved in transporting uh, this patient from another hospital to a burn center. If you see this, you come across this, you make sure your airway is secured. Two ties on the endotracheal tube, 
very, very careful when you're moving the patient. If you dislodge the tube in this patient, getting an airway here is extremely difficult. It is unlikely that you'll be able to orally reintubate this patient. It is unlikely that you'll be able to ventilate this patient even if you put in something like a combi tube, simply because the hypopharyngeal area is so swollen. The cord area is swollen shut so much, it's hard to move air through here. This is a, a critical airway on a patient. Again, this is what he looked like on admission, and this is what he looked like two days later. Okay, these are full thickness burns that we're talking about. And remember, full thickness burns can occur from different mechanisms of injury. I'm going to show you two different types here. This is a flame injured patient, and later I'm going to show you an electrical injured patient with full thickness injuries. There are also is steam uh, related injuries here in San Diego County. We have the shipyards, we have the Navy, and we have steam plants in many of our large uh, campuses and factories that are here that's running some of the, the power and some of the heat to these areas. And so when workers go down in to these tunnels, they can actually get a steam burn injury. And those patients actually look very pale, almost white when they have full thickness injuries. So this is just somebody who happens to have a full thickness flame injury. This is another patient that was involved in a recreational injury out on an ATV. It crashed and it burned. So we have a combination of trauma in this patient as well as burns in this patient. And this was greater than 90% total body surface area. And you can see by looking at it how deeply this burned. Many of the areas of this patient were a combination of third degree burns and fourth degree burns. So underneath the skin, the epidermis and dermis, the fat was burned and in many areas the muscles were actually burned too. Very devastating and, uh, and uh, fatal injury for this patient. And you can see on the legs here, this is the worst. The char here is significant as the, as the patient's pants uh, burned on, on, on the patient. Um, this is another patient, a different patient. This is a different look to, 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 to the flame injury. So this patient's shirt caught fire. And this is a patient after he's been clean and about two days after being in the hospital with us. It didn't burn as deeply to cause that char on the skin, but you can see the skin looks dead. It's pale, it's white, it's brown in, in multiple areas. And this is a full thickness burn with a different look to it than the, these, these other looks like this. So full thickness all looks a little bit differently. And this is more what a steam burn mechanism of injury like in, in your patients. And this is a, a, a look of a, of a full thickness burn that was caused by gasoline that was thrown into a fire to cause it to accelerate its burn. And some of the gasoline actually went through the fire and splashed on this male. And this is a full thickness burn that you see here. This is about a day old burn and you can already see the dead skin beginning to try to slough off. It's turned this kind of yellow brown look. If you were to wipe it with the gauze, that part would just come off. And what you see in the center is this real pale area. This is another child that was out raking some leaves with his parents and they burned the pile of leaves and his shirt caught fire. Here's his initial picture and you actually look at it and you go, well, maybe it's not that bad. There's some red erythema around the periphery, so maybe that's a deep partial thickness burn. But it's real pale as we look down here in the, in, in the mid portion. And this is what it looks like a, a day later. That nice erythema that you saw all around the periphery gone, completely gone. Almost all of this is replaced with this white with maybe little hint of, of, of pink in, in it. This is a full thickness injury. And this is just a picture where we went ahead and grafted the child. This is a one to one and a half mesh that you see on the bottom. It actually goes all the way into his axilla and what we put on top of the mesh was just some cadaver skin to protect the mesh because this was an area of a lot of friction. We put him in an airplane splint and it did not shear off. It actually did well. Now these are third degree burns and fourth degree burns related to electrical injury. And we all talk about high voltage versus low voltage. Normally we talk about high voltage being a thousand volts. Yes, it is high voltage, but it doesn't matter so much what the voltage is as it matters what the conductivity of the electrical impulse into your body is. So if you take somebody who has uh, just a, 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 a access to a typical house outlet, 110 volts. You go ahead and you put a paper clip in there like your little child's opt to do and they get a little shock. 
maybe there's a little tiny superficial burn on their hand. You put that same child, put a little bit of water on the floor, now the conductivity is completely different. You put that, uh, that safety pin or that uh, paper clip into the socket and you've got a significant burn and or an electrical uh, disarrangement of the heart dysrhythmia that, that occurs. So this is a patient who ran into a 220 line. He was carrying an aluminum ladder. He was just going to be working alongside the house. Left hand is on top, right hand is on the bottom. Left hand, you can see it's on the palmar surface as well as on the distal aspect of his forearm. The right arm, it's mostly on the distal out and the forearm. You can imagine how he had his hands wrapped around the ladder with the top of the ladder going towards the sky. He ran into the pole. Let me show you his exit wounds, two exit wounds. On the right, there's a toe exit wound, and on the left is a right groin exit wound. You're looking at his right thigh, you're looking at his lower abdomen, and his perineal area is actually sliced off or cut, cropped off the, off the picture. So he had two exit wounds, one on the thigh and one on the foot where this, this, this exited. So you have to worry about not only the burns in these areas of the foot, the thigh, and the arms, but everything in between. And what you notice going back looking at this picture, look at the way his hands are in a fist. If you try to open his fingers, you meet a great amount of resistance. It is hard to open and they spring back shut. That tells you that this is a deep burn. It tells you that the muscles proximal to that have been injured and have contracted in through here to bring the fingers down into this position. It tells you that this wrist and this hand burn is a third or a fourth degree burn, as opposed to just a superficial burn in which I could move these fingers. So when you see that in the field, when you see somebody on a, uh, in flexion, and they will always go into flexion because the flexors will beat out the extensors in almost every portion of your body, if you see that, that is a terribly deep burn, okay? Let's go forward here and let me show you that left hand. This is that left hand in surgery. All of the muscles, all of the muscles in the left forearm were dead. They were necrotic, as was the radial artery and the ulnar artery. We did an interposition graft of, of, of the uh, radial artery. It did not work. This patient, unfortunately, on, uh, over a course of a uh, number of weeks of hospitalization and attempts to salvage both of these arms, ended up with bilateral mid forearm and distal forearm amputations, okay? This was, these were non-salvageable injuries. And you can tell that, this, as I mentioned, this is gonna be a bad injury by looking at this picture right here. So what I've tried to show you, in part, are the difference between the very superficial first degree burns and then the second degree burns, partial thickness, superficial, deep partial, th uh, partial thickness, and then the full thickness, third degree and fourth degree burns now. So let's just take a minute and, 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 and see how can we best estimate what our TBSA is because I need to know as best from you in the field what the depth of the burn may look like to you as well as the amount of burn the patient has. So there are three ways to do this. There's a simple rule of nines in which we break up the body into sections of nine. Each upper extremity, 9%. 9% of my left arm, 9% of my right arm. Or if I wouldn't remember what my left and right is, my left arm is 9%, my right arm is 9%. Your legs are bigger than your arms. They're actually twice as big in surface area. So left leg is 18%, right leg is 18%. Anterior torso from my perineum to my neck, 18%. My entire back, 18%. And the head, circumferentially, is another 9%. It changes a little bit in kids because kids' heads are bigger and are disproportionately big compared to their body. And so in a child, it's actually 18% that is up on the on the head. So by rules of nine, we can look at and try and guesstimate how, how bad uh, much of a surface area is burned. So if half of my uh, forearm, half of my right arm is burned, that's about four and a half percent, and my entire anterior torso is burned, that's another what? 18%, so 18 plus 4.5%, 22.5% total body surface area burn. You just keep adding on like that. The more accurate way to do it is with a Lund Browder chart. And if you look here, you've got a picture of a male, and they have pictures of 
children also because the percentages change as I mentioned to you. And if you look along the bottom, it gives you the age of the patient. So age less than one year of age, one year of age, five years of age, 10 in an adult. And it breaks up the percentages. And here we can be very precise on how much is a partial thickness burn, how much is a full thickness of burn, and what the total TVSA is. This is what we use in the hospital after we had time to clean the patient up and go ahead and estimate the burn. This may be difficult for you to use in the field, but on the other hand, it may be easy just to refer to this and pencil in where you think the patient is burned and then add up the, uh, the percentages. Now what's really nice is we've made uh, a number of these cards for you to, to have in the rigs for you. Things that talk about the depth of burn, talk about how to estimate the total body surface area burn, and then cards that actually go out in the field with you that give you an idea how much to resuscitate a patient. Very soon in San Diego County, starting I think with San Diego Fire and Rescue, we're going to be having the ability to put this on computers. So on your Palm Pilots, et cetera, that you're using now, or, or small uh, Palms that you'll be getting in some of the fire departments, we hope to see and be able to put this reference material on in a usable form that's bigger and easy for you to see. So we hope to see that uh, come into to play uh, very soon. And lastly, you can use the Palmer surface area to try and guesstimate the, 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 the total surface area that's burned. You take the patient's palm. So if it's my palm, this is about between one and one and a half percent uh, TBSA. So uh, if uh, my torso is burned in this area, that might be one, two, three percent TBSA. If my forearm is burned in circumferentially from here to here, it might be one, two, three percent TBSA. And if we would go to the one browder chart, actually the forearm is one and a half percent on the dorsal side and one and a half percent on the palmar side. So it correlates pretty well. You just have to remember, it's the patient's palm from the fingertips to the beginning of the wrist, not your palm. So if it's a little child, you've got to kind of map out their palm on the burn surface area. So I gave you three ways to look at it. One is the, the rule of nine. Second is the Lund Browder chart. And lastly is the, the rule of this, the Palmer surface of the uh, hand. And remember, everything that looks black and dark isn't necessarily burn. Patients who have been in a closed space fire for a long period of time may have a lot of soot on them. And when we finally clean the soot up, the burn may be much, much less than the amount of soot that's there. But if you have to make a call, overcall the burn. Overcall the burn in the TBSA, overcall the burn in the depth so we get them in and we can take care of them. And if it happens to be less, that's fine. It's better for the patient. So in conclusion then, what I wanted to talk to you about is the initial estimation of the burns, some of the mechanisms of injury of the burns that occur, the amount of BTUs that might be brought into play on this burn injury. And remember, it's the amount of BTUs times the amount of time you're in contact with that, which is going to determine the the depth of burn that you sustain. Then I wanted to talk about the different depths of the burn, go over about the histopath of that a little bit, give you a lot of picture examples so you're used to seeing what these different burns look like. And then lastly, to just be able to calculate what the TBSA burn is. Because what, what we need to hear from you when you call it in is, hey, I've got two patients coming in. Patient number one is involved in a structure fire, involved in a flame injury. He's got an estimated 50% total body surface area burn and includes his face. He's having respiratory difficulty now. Uh, at the scene, his vital signs were 120 over uh, 80. His pulse is tacking away at about 140. He's in a lot of pain and he's beginning to develop some respiratory difficulty. We're in root to your facility now. These are the treatments that we're giving. We're giving him a medium dosed inhaler with albuterol. He's on a 100% non rebreather mask. We've started two large bore IVs and we're starting intravenous fluid resuscitation on this patient. And our estimated uh, ETA is about 20 minutes to your institution. So far, the response to our treatment, we're having an increased airway movement, less wheezing, and we, we wrap the, band, the burns in just some warm, clean gauze. What did I do there? I gave you the MIVIT report, the same report that you give in trauma all the time. Mechanism of injury, injuries that are seen, treatments in the field, reactions to the treatment or response to the treatment, and what's going on in transport. What treatments am I giving in transport? 
It's trauma, only it's a different type of trauma. So I hope you got a little bit from this, just uh, talking about the different types of burns, the depths of burns, and the total body surface area. I look forward to seeing you in our next one where we talk about burn resuscitation. Thanks, have a great day, and most of all, be safe.